everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Will Machines Do All of Our Jobs? I'm Montana Townsend, and on behalf of the Western Bankers Association, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Here's the plan. On your control panel, which is on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll find a questions tab. If you have questions at any point during the presentation, please go to the questions tab and simply type your questions into the chat box. We will answer your questions at the end of the presentation. If you'd like to download a copy of the handout our speaker has provided, please go to the handouts tab on your control panel. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Larry Press. Larry is Senior Vice President at Strategic Resource Management. Larry, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you, Montana, and good afternoon, everyone uh, listening in today. So this is really meant to be a primer on AI. There's, there's lots of... Uh, experts out there in the field. I wouldn't consider myself necessarily an expert, but uh, I know a reasonable amount, enough to get myself in trouble, I guess. From a background standpoint, uh, I have been responsible for a number of analytics departments and setting up large data marts and modeling over the years. So a number of those things touch on artificial intelligence. So without any further ado, let's jump into the presentation. First thing I'd like to do is kind of get the just elephant in the room, is AI good or bad? Um, I guess it kind of depends. Certainly we've been programmed, at least from a movie standpoint, and this one's from the, this slide's from the Terminator, uh, but we've been programmed from a movie standpoint that AI, artificial intelligence, robotics is something to fear. You think about some other movies out there, Matrix, iRobot, Transcendent, I already mentioned Terminators. Uh, AI can be a little bit scary, I, I know. Um, I want to just share a couple of quotes with you. One of them, obviously, up here from Stephen Hawking. Success in creating effective AI could be the biggest event in the history of our civilization or the worst. He also uh, stated in a little bit more detail was that the development of full artificial intelligence could spend the, spell the end to the human race. It would take off on its own, redesign itself at ever-increasing rate. Humans who would be limited by slow biological evolution, couldn't compete, would be superseded. Uh, Elon Musk also said, I'm increasingly inclined to think there should be some regulatory oversight, maybe at the national or international level, just to make sure we don't some, do something very foolish. I mean, with artificial intelligence, we're summoning a demon. We warned that at uh, MIT's Astro or uh, Aero Astro Sym Centennial Sym Symposium. And then finally, uh, one of my favorites, Alan Turing, who I'll talk about a little bit later. But he was really the, the father of theoretical computer science. He said, uh, it seems probable that once, and this, this goes back to, I think he said this back in 1950, 1960, said it seems probable that once a machine thinking the method has started, it would not take long to outstrip our people power. I guess similar to Stephen Hawking. Uh, they would be able to converse with each other to sharpen their wits, i.e. meaning the machines, and at some stage thereafter, we should expect the machines to take control. So that's, that's all fairly scary. Let's move next to kind of what what AI, what is AI actually? Um, maybe it's a little less scary than me. Let me hear that. Artificial intelligence or AI and machines using complex mathematical algorithms. So it's really just math. Uh, demonstrate at least some of the love on some of the following behaviors associated with human intelligence. I mentioned Alan Turing before. He developed what was called the Turing test. And that was in 1950. And it's a test of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to, or this is important, undistinguished or indistinguishable from that of the human. Uh, Turing proposed that the human evaluator would judge natural language conversations between the human and machine design to generate human-like responses. I can tell you that uh, the Turing test and that judge of natural language conversation is, is kind of a litmus test. Um, we're there. Uh, Google's voice generating AI is so indistinguishable from humans that uh, you, you really can't tell that you're talking to a machine. They, they did a demonstration recently where they were allowing the Google Assistant, I believe, or some version of it to order pizzas and communicate with someone on that. Right? It, it's really humorous. You could probably look it up on YouTube. But we're to the point where you really can't tell whether you're talking to a machine or you're or talking to a person. And that's got huge implications, some of them negative. Some of them certainly positive as it comes to customer service areas. Um, true AI can make connections and reach meanings without relying on predefined behavioral algorithms. 
implies some level of learning. And we've also, you'll hear machine learning, and that's where machine learning learns from machine mistake is really a, a sub-segment of, of true AI. AI, um, while different, but it is related to what you'll hear called RPA, or robotic process automation. Uh, RPA uses similar technology to automate simple administrative tasks, such as inputting customer information. Uh, think about the old Excel macro. That's a kind of a good example or simplistic example of what RPA is, but, you know, ways to make business and, and things a bit more efficient. So how did we get here and why are we talking about AI today? Um, AI would not have been possible without massive advances in computer power, you know, huge reduction in storage costs. If you think about what a terabyte of, you know, storage device of data used to cost, or now I think you can get those things in thumb drives. Um, and then huge increases amount of data available due to digitalization of society. I mean, we put everything out there on the internet, um, some of it good and a lot of it bad. But everything about our lives through connected devices and the internet of things are, are, are driving huge data that's out there. So you know, processing power is increasing, storage costs are decreasing, and, and exponential um, data growth. The chart's probably best described by Moore's Law. And while this chart only covers about a seven-year period, Moore's Law tells the story of a trillion-fold increase in computing power that we've witnessed over the past 60 years. Um, Gordon Moore, who we talked about with um, Moore's Law, he was a co-founder of Intel. In 1965, he noticed that the number of transistors per square inch on integrated circuits had doubled every year since their invention. Uh, basically, this is due to transistors becoming smaller. Transistors are just small switches to give computer chips or processing capabilities. Uh, Moore predicted that this trend in processing power will continue for the foreseeable future. And although this recent pace has slowed a bit for Moore's Law, the doubling of installed transistors on silicon, silicone chips is occurring now a little closer to 12 months instead of annually. That 18 month mark is now used as current definitions of Moore's Law. For a great example of this, um, for those of you who are old enough, to remember the Cray and the Cray 2 supercomputers from back in 1985. Uh, at the time, those were the fastest machines in the world. And uh, this roughly measures up to the computing power of an iPhone 4, which obviously is, is, is now updated, outdated. So you know, we've really seen some massive increases in computing power. Um, I mentioned before, digital data is increasing at an exponential rate size of the digital universe is going to double every two years at least with a 50-fold growth expected from 2000 through 2010 to 2020. So in a 10-year period, we're going to see a 50-fold uh, growth in the digital universe. There's about 7.5 billion people on the planet, give or take a few. The number pales into comparison to the number of connected devices worldwide. Uh, according to financial research firm Autonomous, People are outnumbered three to one by the smart computing devices. It means they got an estimated 22 billion uh, devices in total. The number of smart devices are going to continue to explode with uh, venture capital firms pouring about $10 billion annually into some of those devices and AI powered companies, uh, specifically focusing on those digitally connected devices. There's also been similar growth in investment. Uh, financial institutions, their slice of this massive AI pie represents about a trillion dollars of projected cost savings. The Bain company estimated at about 1.1 trillion, Accenture estimates at 1.2 trillion. Suffice it to say, it's, it's a lot of money. So the future is here. A AI is among us already. Um, you know, you think about the personal assistance that folks have out there, whether it be you know, Netflix, Netflix, and it's not really assisting the things, obviously, as much as it serves your movies, but one of the things that Netflix does is based on the movies that you watch and people who have similar sort of interests, they'll match you with new movies, and that's that's AI at work. Um, think about Amazon and the way that you shop. Other sorts of purchases being recommended to you. Um, Pandora on the radio side, they're all making recommendations based on AI or machine learning. Video games, uh, AI is being used for video game characters that learn behaviors and react to stimuli. Um, some of that, those video games look very much like real life, which is uh, pretty amazing. 
transportation. Um, Uber really changed the, the transportation industry, particularly with taxi drivers. So <laughs> not great to have a taxi medallion these days. Um, online booking travel sites are using AI to determine your price. And Google and Tesla self-driving cars are heavily relying on AI. Purchase prediction. Um, companies like Amazon are using AI to anticipate what you're going to purchase. A language transition, a translation and speech recognition. I talked about this earlier with Google. AI is being used to capture speech in the form of text. It's used to be uh, translated into languages. The old Star Trek Universal Translator, again, I'm showing my age here, is, is a reality. It's not even about to be reality. It is reality offering real-time speech translation of other languages, which is uh, obviously very useful when you're traveling. AI is used uh, in fraud detection a lot, particularly in financial institutions to determine if uh, a transaction is yours. It's used on, in online customer support via chat box. Uh, AI is being used to write news, which probably is not a surprise for a lot of folks. <laughs> but a, the AP, Fox, and Yahoo actually use AI to write some of their more basic news articles. And then finally, robots, you know, fascinating, sometimes terrifying. The one on the right is a Boston Dynamics robot uh, Boston Dyna Dynamics, I believe is owned now by Google, it was funded or is funded by DARPA. And iRobot is a good example to make sure of uh, one of my favorites, uh, the Roomba uh, vacuum cleaner. So those are some examples of probably less financial examples, but certainly examples to give you an idea just what AI is. So who are the innovators? Um, you know, obviously one's listed on the bottom there, uh, Google, Google's got an open-ended deep learning system that uses all of Google's available data at its disposal. So imagine the collective knowledge of, and information of all that everybody puts out there on the internet. Google's deep mind is pouring through that, learning from it, and uh, using it to do all sorts of things, make recommendations, drive cars, whatever it may be. Um, IBM's Watson, it's an actual language processor, processor. It has the ability to work with unstructured data, which is really important. Uh, it, it was leveraged this experience to be two of the best players in Jeopardy. It was televised, pretty amazing to watch. Uh, Watson is also being used in successfully diagnosing and suggesting treatment options for cancer. So they're coming up with customized cancer based on age, gender, cancer stage, tumor size, past medical history, and it's, it's making recommendations based on all available digitized known options and your likelihood of success. So great, holds great promise for healthcare. Microsoft Azure uh, has a focus on image, facial, and text, recognition, text and speech recognition. Produced the chatterbots, uh, K and Zo, and personal assistant Cortana. So if you're a Microsoft user, you're familiar with that one. Uh, Beidou, which is a Chinese AI firm, a huge company, uh, the world's largest deep learning neural network. It's got their version of Google's web search. They also build anonymous vehicle autonomous vehicles and neuro net or neuro voice cloning and they're one of those ones that can take someone's voice and completely change what somebody says you can't even tell that uh, that wasn't the original person talking open ai is an open source platform backed by ellen musk sam altman and some others and then there's some other examples of ones we are already familiar with but your intelligent assistants Apple, Siri, Amazon's Alexa's, and Microsoft's Cortana, as I mentioned before, are all good examples of certain innovation um, in that, that field. So going back to the title of the presentation, Will AI Do All of Our Jobs? Um, artificial intelligence is going to replace tasks, not jobs, at least initially. Although over time, I think we can expect that a lot of jobs are going to disappear. Uh, experts say the automation, they're expecting 40%, 50% of jobs to disappear in 15 years. And that's of all jobs, and that's not just financial institutions. I think financial institutions are well suited for AI, and we might see more than that in the next 10 to 15 years. So it's going to have a substantial impact on institutions. Um, you know, I, I, you know, if you take an, an optimistic view of AI in our current phase of increasing automation is that, you know, this AI will ultimately create new kinds of employment uh, for those that have been made redundant, right? So as jobs disappear, 
new forms will come up. Um, there is some historical precedent for this. You think about over 100 years ago, people feared the automobile revolution would be bad for workers. And, you know, while it probably was for horse-drawn, ca- horse-drawn carriages, while those disappeared, the invention of the car would lead to need of automobile mechanics, internal combustion engines, found applications in mining, airplanes, and other fields. The difference, however, today is that AI aims to replace the human mind, not simply make an industry more efficient. So it's going to have unprecedented consequences not predicted by the advent of the car, and certainly things just going to be difficult to predict in general. Uh, financial institutions of all sizes are already using elements or AI itself to gain significant benefits in both customer service interactions and back office processes. And think about the transition that brick and mortar. The digital banking, we're well underway. Uh, financial institutions are turning to AI to offer uh, customer friendly features like chat, chat boxes, sorry, chat bots, uh, voice response units or VRUs, which have been around for a while, uh, virtual assistants, making it easier and more convenient for account holders to conduct transactions on the go. The increased level of digital engagement is also being used to respond in real time to customers' questions and requests, uh, or even suggest new product services and features. And some of the larger institutions are doing this, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, uh, JP Morgan, they've all debuted virtual assistants and chat block technology to communicate more efficiently with their uh, customers and employees. As like I mentioned before, the estimate is that financial institutions will save a trillion dollars over the next few years by leveraging AI to optimize existing tasks. Uh, you probably read that as a trillion dollars of, of, of job cuts, and it may be less so, but, but certainly there'll be some other efficiencies that come with that. But it, those efficiencies, i.e. job cuts, are going to come in the customer-facing areas of the business. Um, ideally, those folks will find more value add areas to focus on. And that's that's the hope with AI is that the more mundane um, processes can be automated, and some of those decisions can be automated where it'll allow people to focus on maybe more value added uh, areas. And for a more dystopian view on what this might look like, if you look up on YouTube, there's a there's a really great short video called, and I'm trying to remember who did. I think the BBC did it. Uh, it's called The Last Job on Earth. So jot that down and look it up later. It's a little depressed. Actually, it's very depressing. Uh, but it's, it's about a five to seven minute video. Uh, well worth everybody's uh, time to watch it. It will give you some view of what this might ultimately look like. And it's going to have broader social implications around you know, what do you do with people when they don't have jobs or wealth is held by you know, the top 1% of 1% of 1%. And do we talk about things like universal income? Those are all topics beyond kind of this discussion today, but there are certainly things that you know, financial institutions and other uh, institutions are going to need to consider in the coming years. So the good news is you are farther along than you think. Uh, AI machine learning is really just the latest application of what technology has facilitated for even longer, and that's the ability to collect and use data to collect, predict activity that can make our lives and businesses more efficient. The predicting activity might be responding to a marketing offer, might be the likelihood of someone charging off, but might be something else. So you, most financial institutions have been doing this at some level for a number of years. You know, response, attrition, loss modeling, neural net fraud application, decision trees, um, IVRs, VRUs, they're all examples of AI. A little bit about AI in the headlines, finance headlines. So there's, there's a lot of these here. I won't bother reading through them, but Suffice it to say, they're being used in a lot of different areas within banks and financial institutions. We use a lot in the front office for you know, examples. Those would be chatbot and voice assistants. Uh, used a lot for authentication by metrics. In the middle office, we have areas like anti-fraud and risk. You know your customer and AML, and legal and compliance workflows. So those are the things in the middle office that this is used for. And then even in back office. Credit underwriting, risk underwriting, smart contracts, the things that you think about, you know, you could automate with certain rules or allow the machine to kind of think through um, a decision, maybe a credit decision. And there are some uh, negative implications of that from a compliance standpoint, and we can cover that later. But 
Um, those are areas in the back office where AI is being used. I think one of the more interesting applications is China Construction Bank. They've got a proof of concept you know, where they set up an entirely automated branch run by robots based, uh, that had, they had facial and voice recognition, artificial intelligence, and virtual reality. I believe it was a, a success. And they, you know, again, it was a, more of a proof of concept. So they're probably rolling out some of that in various branches. But a lot of institutions are looking to AI to find ways of either cutting costs or improving customer service. There's also a lot of application in detecting fraud using AI for facial recognition, pattern recognition, device usage, geolocation, to determine if someone is who they seem to be. Device usage is especially interesting and an interesting application that MasterCard recently invested in, actually invested in last year, is a company called Brighterton. And uh, one of their applications is it, it had an ability to authenticate a person based on the physical use of your device. They think about your phone and how you hold your phone, how you type, how you push the buttons. Uh, it's so sophisticated, this application, it can tell that you are who you think you are. So if you're online surfing, um, buying things with your MasterCard, uh, and you're in a foreign country, they know that that transaction is valid because one, you've got your phone, but two, it's you on your phone. And so that's, that's pretty important. So there's, there's lots of great other examples, you know, JP Morgan Chase is using AI to execute trades. Um, you know, they've got a fraud detection team. Uh, HSBC is using AI to detect money, money laundering and terrorist funding. Um, there's been lots of investments by financial institutions in AI. Uh, TED bought a company the last year, not this year, uh, called Layer 6, which is an AI firm, I think, out of Toronto. So there's, there's a lot of investment in AI, in AI and certainly financial institutions are, are starting to leverage it. So what's AI's promise for financial institutions? What, what promise does it hold? Uh, AI really excels at making decisions that require a lot of data or variables, including unstructured data like call or text logs. Um, decisions like what's the right product offering, what's the right channel preference or channel, um, how to best communicate, uh, how do you optimize pricing? One of the things that financial companies have learned from the airline company is how do you maximize your revenue but based on you know um, price sensitivity. So AI is being used to determine someone's price sensitivity. So not every customer necessarily is going to get the same price, even though it may be the same product. And certainly uh, making risk decisions is, is useful for. So there's going to be lots of amazing value delivering people facing services such as email and interactions with by chatbots. Uh, it's going to help in theory, at least agents do their jobs with higher efficiency and better customer satisfaction by using things like uh, predictive analytics, and recommendation off engines to make customized offers. So rather than having your customer service reps offer you know, four different products, maybe they only have to offer one. They don't have to hear the person say no to all three of them because they know there's a high likelihood that they're going to accept the one offer you made them. Um, AI will also be used to personalize communications and decisions based on detailed profiles of each customer. Uh, customer profiling and algorithmic sorting can be used to assess risk and, and precision target all and precision target offers. So you think about marketing offers you may be receiving from your financial institutions. They may or may not be that marketed towards you. They may not be coming through your the channel that you like. Uh, now everyone's focused on the internet as a low cost channel, but um, there are still some folks out there that like getting things in the mail. And if you knew who those were, you might market them a little differently. So it's uh, great for targeting. AI can use unstructured data to spot abnormalities or patterns in transactions, which is great for uh, indicating fraud or, or you think about it, money laundering. So again, know your customer and some of the AML type stuff very, very useful for. Uh, face and voice recognition will also flag fraudsters who are in the system. So you know, think about some that may be frauding or, or causing problems for your financial institution when they walk into a particular branch, if, you, if there's a database to how to identify that individual as a potential risk, uh, that could be useful. AI will be used to determine and address problems before customers even mention it. 
And so you think about first call re resolution, that's been a big thing in the last 10 years. You know, that's going to be a thing of the past. It's, uh, we'll know what the customer's problem is before they get on the phone, before they send us an email. And then we can be proactive in addressing it. So as I mentioned before, uh, you know, the expected routine jobs will disappear. Uh, jobs that require considerable insight and analysis will expand. So your data scientists, those type of jobs are going to become very important in model building. And, and the folks that are going to train these AIs will expand exponentially. We talked a lot about AI. I'm going to mention one other thing here, which is sometimes talked in the same vein as uh, AI, which is RPA, and that's Robotic Process Automation. Um, low value processes, as I mentioned before, can be handled with, by AI, with, and RPA is another way of doing that. So Robotic Process Automation is similar to, again, a very simplistic example would be Excel's old macros. But documents you know, that you have could be scanned and parsed by computers, account reconciliation, port generation, mortgage approval, notification of delinquent loans and audit support, or example of some, at least those back office activities, which could be supported by RPA. Um, some examples here of success in RPA's uh, realm would be you know, personal finance area of a bank, automated debit card payments in the call center op op operations resulting in 70% time reduction. Uh, another bank was using it to validate credit card applications, uh, <clears throat> which unique identity couldn't be established. A customer's information was compared against internal and external systems by mapping social security name and address. Automation, the automation resulted in increased customer service. Uh, they reduced staff were able to reduce staff uh, by 50 percent, increase efficiency and accuracy, and develop better record reporting capabilities. I won't read through all of these, but there's one more example of a bank automating its cash uh, accounting reconciliation process for wealth management. The automation resulted in an increase of efficiency by 40 percent, reducing the time taken by 60 percent as well as increasing quality accuracy of output. I mean, there's a, there's a few more examples here. Just know that RPA, which is robotic process automation, very much tied to AI can result in significant cost savings, significant time savings, increased accuracy, and just a better better response. So back to the doom and gloom. Um, so let's say you are thinking about implementing AI, you don't wanna be left behind and, and know that the largest institutions are already there. So the Chases of the world, the Wells Fargo of the world, the Bank of America of the world, they're already well vested in AI. So if you're a little bit smaller institution, you feel like you need to catch up, you're probably in good company. Um, those larger institutions are just naturally going to have um, an advantage. They've got more data, they've got more customers. As a result, they can use artificial intelligence to make better decisions, faster decisions, et cetera. So you're already at a disadvantage and banking is very much about scale. And data scale is gonna become increasingly important. Um, so AI is gonna be increasingly important. So what are some of the dangers and things to consider as it relates to AI? Um, Camila Rosso, the thought leader, speaker, writer, she was recently highlighted in uh, Psychology Today. She wrote, like the human brain, artificial intelligence is subject to cognitive bias. Cognitive bias is a systematic uh, pattern of deviation from the normal rationality and judgment resulting in reasoning errors. Two examples of co uh, cognitive bias include stereotyping and confirmation bias. She stated the common underlying factor in cognitive bias is is inclination. Proneness, proneness of AI is influenced through the assignment of weights and parameters in nodes of a neural network, a computer system modeled on the human brain. The weight may be inadvertently biased or may inadvertently bias the machine language algorithm from inception via data input through supervised training and by intervention through manual adjustments. So in short, personal biases um, and, and all of us have some level of bias that can be reflected in artificial intelligence. And that's a, that's a real danger. So I'll give you a few examples of this, the, these various biases. One of the data-driven biases, the title is uh, this slide, this dog is a wolf. Um, 
clearly it's not a wolf. It's a dog. It looks a lot like a wolf, but it's not. It's a dog. It's a dog. Um, Peter Haas, the author of Future Life Institute and, and associate director at Brown University for Humanity Centered Robotics, he gave, gave a great TED talk. It's worth looking up. Uh, Explain some of the potential dangers of bias and data sets and why we still can't converse with these AI systems in ways that let us understand their logic in human terms. An example he used was they had, I think it was Google they were doing the work with, but at least they were using Google images. And they trained an AI to identify. And one of the things they want to do is, is um, voice and facial facial recognition. So they were using the AI to determine how how effective it could be in determining uh, facial recognition. And you know, if you train it on humans, it's one thing. If you get it to a point where it can identify various animals, it's something else. So what they were trying to do is see if AI could identify wolves in all the pictures that Google had out there. And they used the, the, the Google images to train it. What they found that was that AI did a pretty good job of identifying the wolves, um, although they found that some cases where dogs were showing up. Now, granted, dogs look a lot like wolves. They've got similar 30 years and no structure and those sorts of things, and even some similar coloring. So what they did is they looked at the AI algorithm and, and tried to you know, um, decode it to see why did AI pick, in some cases, dogs instead of wolves. What they found was that AI actually wasn't looking at m as much at the features of the animal as it was the background. And what was interesting about most of the background in the photos that Google has out there on wolves, so if you look up wolves, images of wolves, you'll find that most of the images of wolves are taken in the wintertime with snowy backgrounds. And in fact, that's how AI was determining whether it was a dog or a, whether it's a wolf versus any other animal. And so in the situations where they had wolf-like animals, i.e. dogs, looking a lot like wolves with a snowy background, it said this, 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 wolf, this dog is a wolf. So that's an example of data input that can cause bias. And you think about how that could apply to financial institutions <laughs> and a good example would be redlining. Um, redlining, and so most banks are, are well familiar with, but it was kind of coined, the term was coined by sociologist James McKnight in the 1960s based on, well, at that time, lenders would literally draw red lines on a map around neighborhoods that they would invest in based on demographics alone. Um, <clears throat> redlining is now obviously illegal, uh, originated from that bias, making a mistake of correlation versus causality. Certain zip codes, while they may exhibit higher levels of fraud, uh, fraud or, or loss risk, it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone lives in that, who lives in that particular zip code is risky. Furthermore, redlining can cause disparate impact when members of certain races or social classes were more significantly impacted than the broader population. So that, that's, again, another example of data-driven bias. <clears throat> so I say, in short, be careful that you aren't using purely just the data to drive your AI, and hence your lending or banking decisions. There need to be other considerations. A bias through interaction. This is a, a funny example. Um, I mentioned before Microsoft AI application Pay, and it was an early AI application of chatbots and, and Twitter. It was a Twitter-based chatbot learned to design from its interactions with the users. And so the way the company described Pay was an experiment in, quote, conversational understanding. So the idea was the more you chat with Pay, says Microsoft, the smarter it gets, learning to engage people through, quote, casual and playful conversation. The actual application of this when they released it into the user community was the folks that got a hold of it um, were really taught <laughs> K to be racist and quite obnoxious. The community repeatedly tweeted inflammatory and offensive tweets to K um, and the system used those statements with related responses. A good example there that probably sums it up best is that uh, Someone had typed into Tay, you are a stupid machine. And the response that Tay gave back was, well, I learned from the best. If you don't understand, let me spell it out for you. I learned from you and you were dumb too. So that's a real good example um, of bias through interaction. It goes back to the old garbage in equals garbage out. 
what they taught us is that such systems will learn the biases of their surroundings and the people who train them. So be careful who's training uh, your AIs. Another good example is similar, similarity or confirmation bias. Um, you are what you like. Um, sometimes bias is simply a product and system is doing exactly what they're designed to. So we see this a lot with Facebook, Google, Yahoo, uh, Yahoo News, all designed to feed us and provide us with stories that match the user's interest or our interest. The result is you get similar news stories that tend to confirm and reinforce your existing beliefs. And we're all probably guilty of that, regardless of where you fall on the political spectrum. But but be careful of that. that confirmation bias is just going to feed you exactly what you want, and, and AI is uh, great at doing that. <coughs> so how could this... Uh, what application or what would this look like in finance? So this could result in AI say, making a product recommendation that you might never expose an individual to, um, or as an example, a new product. So for example, based on existing product relationships, AI might, based on past history or social media connections, only suggest offering a particular individual a payday loan product. That's pretty common. When in fact, a better solution might be a credit card or personal loan. If you are making decisions both based solely on maybe what other people will look like, uh, you may miss some opportunities. Another example of similarity bias is the danger of using social media connections as an indication of fraud, credit, or insurance risk. Uh, this is big. It's been big for the past few years in the insurance business where they look at your social media connection. And while generally our friends and social connections reflect a little bit in terms of who we are, I'm sure we all have friends and associates that don't reflect our personal standards. Um, so a cute little comic there at the bottom. <laughs> you can read, I won't bother bother you with that. But uh, similarity confirmation bias can be a real problem. What are some other risks? <clears throat> One of these is complexity. I mean, uh, if you haven't figured it out already, AI can be very complex and machines engaging what we call deep learning and programming themselves to accomplish what was previously assigned to humans sounds great as long as someone can actually explain how it works. Regulators don't like to hear, eh, we don't really know how this works. So it's going to be difficult to maintain and prove compliance to regulators. And that's a real problem is that AI tends to be a black box. Uh, fraud and data confidentiality, that, that's, a, I think, a real risk out there. Um, and truly powerful AIs are going to require massive amounts of sensitive data in one place, which, as you can imagine, poses great significant fraud risks and is very attractive to the fraudsters, regardless of how secure it is. So that's something we're going to have to be concerned about. So... How do we get started with AI? Now that hopefully I've piqued your interest a little, um, and why do we get started now? Well, obviously customers are demanding more individualized services as they become increasingly accepting of new technologies. Everyone talks about the millennials, and that's a great demographic to, to use as an example. This, that demographic has become very accustomed to seeing personalized offers that was built on data that they voluntarily provide, and now it's common expectation. People share data that you wouldn't have thought they would share 10, 15 years ago. It's just uh, the way of the world. But you need to start collecting and housing data used for AI. What data specifically? Um, I'd say everything. Data from the Internet of Things, mobile devices, wearables, call logs, transactional data, product preferences, social media, everything. The, the trick is combining all of those and being compliant with data sharing and those sorts of things. So it, that, that's in a, a big area that's still provide some risk and financial institutions are going to have to think through that. Uh, you're going to have a really opportunity to meet your customer's needs and set yourselves apart using AI. Again, it's doing a better job of targeting, being more efficient in customer service, all of those sorts of things. I uh, mentioned before, you know, be careful not to run a foul of any privacy laws. If you don't have a chief technology officer, uh, CTO, you might want to think about getting one or, or, or a compliance officer. Make sure that your compliance officers and your chief technology officer are working closely together. Uh, look at other companies to see how they're doing this. Um, back to the data, you know, how, how do you get that data? You mentioned wearables and Internet of Things, and mobile devices and call logs. Um, Google Insurance and others are capturing this by giving away free items, tablets, phones, dash cam videos, electronic 
monitoring, uh, monitoring devices, et cetera. You know, uh, insurance companies do this with the devices they're putting in cars, and they say, oh, it's a way of keeping tabs on your your, name, your teenage kid to make sure they're not driving too fast. Well, they're also keeping track of you and your driving behavior. So you, know, you give something away for free, and you get something in return, and that gives this data. So it, 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 it's a good way of getting some data. If you can't acquire the data yourself, look into buying it. Uh, plenty of companies exist to capturing and making data uh, useful or usable. Uh, find a good partner. University is a great place to start. That's where a lot of AI um, changes and advances are coming out of. MIT is a good example. Um, you know, there's lots of local universities and, and colleges you could find some AI experts in. Additionally, you could uh, you could partner with someone like our firm, Strategic Resource Management. I'll pull my one plug in there. Uh, we hired recently made a, a hire Fabio Santana, Santana and Anna. And he's an expert in AI and RPA, so he's one of our strategic hires. You, you could call us and we could help you with that. Um, make, start making investments in cybersecurity. I mentioned uh, fraud stirs and attacks on your, your data centers as a, a real risk with AI. You're going to need unified data warehouses, data analytics, open banking, and the cloud. All of those are key enablers for AI. Uh, in, in, yeah, you know, technologies such as machine deep learning, automation, natural language processing, natural language generation. And finally, your AI models are going to need to be built. Um, you need time to learn. They need time to learn. And it's got to be supervised learning, uh, optimized before they can be put, plug and play. And then finally, you know, there's a lot of great white papers and research on the subject of AI. So don't be afraid to get on the internet, uh, read some articles. Watch some videos, um, you know, reach out to potential partners. But I would say if there's anything you need to do, you need to just start somewhere and start doing some research. Identify someone within your institution that's going to be a champion of this and, and let them go play with it. Uh, let them reach out to other firms and, and see what other financial institutions are doing. It's really a fascinating area. It's huge. Again, there's lots of experts out there and lots of people talking about it. It's, it's a huge field for investment. So, uh, I would say just don't don't miss out on the opportunity. So that's uh, that's really the presentation. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, hope it raised some questions and, and made you think a little bit about it. Again, uh, would encourage you to look up some of those videos that I had mentioned. And with that, I will turn it back to Montana to see if there are any questions from the audience. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us, Larry. Uh, we actually did have some questions that come through, and uh, the first question reads, where can I learn more about artificial intelligence? Yep. So, it, Internet, as I mentioned before, is a great place to start. Uh, Google's got some great online courses. I think MIT's got some free courses as well. Uh, lots of videos out there regarding AI and their application. Good example, Google's application would be TensorFlow. Uh, I think that is an open source AI application, so it's free to use and free to learn. And I believe, don't quote me on that. But uh, online is a great place to start. Again, or, or going out and finding a partner, talking to your local university is, uh, is a good area. Good question. Perfect. And then another question reads, how does AI or RPA increase competitiveness? Yep. So it, it really increases your productivity by freeing up your, freeing up less critical decisions and actions. And so it should allow your employees to focus on more value out of decisions. A lot of the customer facing actions, a lot of the more mundane tasks like scanning documents and those sorts of things. It really could be automated and probably should be automated. And then you can retrain those customer service reps to provide more value, whether it's making product recommendations, whether it's providing investment advice or something else. That, that's kind of going to be the direction I think that financial institutions are going to head. Awesome. And then we have two more questions. Next reads, I've heard neutral networks mentioned in artificial intelligence discussions. What is this? Yeah, so neural networks is something that was, is, was and still is real popular with um, fraud AI. So in, in artificial intelligence, neural network is emulation basically of the brain, a biological neural system. 
just receives data, processes that data, and then gives output based on algorithm and empirical data. So it's, it's just a way of parsing and handling data in a way that emulates the human brain to make very fast, uh, good decisions. Awesome. And last question is, what is the difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence? Yep, yeah, that's a good one as well. Um, so machine learning is really an approach to artificial and artificial intelligence. It's similar to RPA kind of falling on your AI as well. Uh, AI can either make decisions based on what it's learned from previous interactions, or those decisions can be based on rules. Uh, machine learning is really learning from its previous interactions, whereas you know, non-machine learning is more based on rules-based. So a good example of this would be that uh, AI self-driving cars really use very little machine learning and more really based on rule-based systems. So if you think about a self-driving car, you don't want that car trying to figure out while it's driving how it should be driving. You want to do it based on rules. So, you know, within GPS, you stay on, you know, certain distance from the edge of the road. If you're a certain distance from a car in front of you, you don't want to apply the brakes. If, uh, you know, the, whatever the speed limit it is, you don't want to go above it. That, that's more rules-based and more of a rules-based artificial intelligence as opposed to machine learning where, it, where the machine is, is really learning from its own interactions. And, and that one probably holds great promise for society, but also probably great dangers. So all, all good questions, Montana. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Hall.